Uh, well, thank you, Rory, and um, it's it's very nice to be here uh, in what has been uh, an excellent conference. I've enjoyed it very much. Um, I have to say, I think uh, maybe you're all a little unfortunate in, in catching me at a bad time on this research question because uh, sort of uh, a major piece of work we had done uh, a few years ago is now old enough that I don't feel like I want to present uh, the results of that because I, 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 the numbers aren't right, frankly, anymore. Um, and we're, we're on the front end of really exploring um, some new projects in this area. So uh, as Rory said, I'm, uh, and particularly in the conclusion of my remarks, I really want to pose questions that I think uh, deserve more attention. Uh, but I do, so I think what I, uh, what I decided I would do with this presentation is, is to review the current picture on uh, debt in low-income countries generally, which uh, clearly has revel relevance for uh, Chinese finance, whether it's in the context of Belt and Road or beyond that particular framework. Um, and here I'm really doing a review of, of the most recent work from the World Bank and the IMF uh, that they released last month. Um, I then will spend uh, time on the policy issues, which frankly um, uh, is, are the issues that are near and dear to my heart. I, as a researcher, I stand before you as an imposter, really. Uh, my, my, my career has been in policy, um, so I try to uh, explore research questions that I think have direct policy relevance uh, uh, in, in the near term. So I'll spend a few minutes there, both um, in, the, in the realm of debt issues and then even more broadly when it comes to questions of infrastructure finance um, and the policy frameworks that both um, developing countries and, and countries that are seeking to support them um, uh, the, the relevant policy issues for both. And then finally, these, these sets of research questions. Um, so I realize that the, the, the first slide I should have had is really um, stating what should be the obvious, or at least not controversial, which is debt risks uh, have been rising a lot uh, for low-income countries. Um, and for the purpose of this uh, conference on uh, particularly fragile uh, settings, uh, those risks are particularly acute. And if you look at the numbers, uh, the standard risk ratings that, that the bank and the fund use, you know, we really s have seen this sharp increase and in, um, uh, what is now 44% of low-income countries either at high risk of debt distress or in debt distress, and that's up from just five years ago when it was 21%. Uh, so there is a reason why uh, debt has been on the agenda in, in the major fora in the last year, two years. Um, and and there, you know, there are reasons to revisit why we have concerns about debt risk and, and the damage that, uh, that um, debt distress can do to, particularly to low-income countries. Um, the, my focus, though, on, on the current debt picture is more about the composition of creditors and, and what have been equally dramatic changes um, to the overall increase in debt risk, we've really seen a striking shift in the composition of creditors, external creditors to low-income countries. I've used this slide a, sl this slide a lot um, in presentations, but I, I do like it because it particularly tells the story of China's emergence. So if we're looking on the left um, over a period of years and look at the composition of creditors for lo all low-income countries, um, we see this growth in China among categories of creditors uh, but it is still the case that the core multilateral institutions remain the leading creditors to low-income countries. I will um, note, though, and it, it'll be more evident in the, in the next slide, uh, there's a little bit of apples and oranges here that, that I think underplays China's importance. Because, in fact, in a, in a presentation like this, we, we create a category for China called China, whereas the others are groups of countries, the Paris Club, uh, multilateral institutions. Now, of course, China has its own uh, individual lenders, but we are defining sort of China's uh, official lending activities, um, uh, China as a sovereign lender. Um, so in any event, we have this picture for low, all low-income countries. When we then focus on a subset of countries that we would define as essentially the riskiest or high, highest risk of debt distress countries among the low incomes, that's where you see this dramatic picture emerge, that essentially China has emerged as the leading creditor in, in the most risky environments. Um, and that, that leaves a lot to explore about China's behavior as a creditor and the implications then for the, the borrowing countries themselves based on what we observe as, as characteristics of, of China's lending patterns. 
Um, so this slide just, uh, and this is pulled directly from, from the bank fund work, but it, it, it makes the, the picture clear in terms of the overall changes in the composition of debt. Uh, this, again, is for all low-income countries in this case, uh, where you see the relative decline of the multilateral institutions and the rise, um, certainly, of China. And then in, in, in more recent years, um, the increased access of, for these countries uh, to, to private bond markets, uh, which is its own uh, important trend, one that I will not uh, really spend time on uh, in, in this discussion. Um, it is notable, I think, even here, though, if we look at the two different time periods, uh, and we observe this in other patterns, that, that the Chinese lending has leveled off has even has even fallen um, compared to what was a dramatic rise over a period of uh, uh, six to eight years. Um, here is a small piece of new research that, that I am presenting from our work at the center. Um, and this is really a fairly uh, modest uh, research exercise. This is working with um, Brad Parks at Aid Data and, and their database there. But we, we wanted to look at, on a project-by-project project basis, the real financing terms associated with projects uh, financed by uh, official Chinese lenders, and then over the same time period in the same countries, World Bank projects. And what we've done here as summary measures is really collapsed. If you're thinking about the World Bank, we're, not, we're, we're looking at the entire portfolio, so we're collapsing IDA and IBRD together. Um, and coming up with a total portfolio measure of financing terms. And the conclusions are not surprising. Uh, overall, the level of concessionality coming from the World Bank is higher than what we see from Chinese lenders. So lower interest rates on average, um, slightly uh, longer maturities, although here I think um, you know, you're seeing the effect of including IBRD lending, that these you know, um, obviously, IDA terms are, are significantly more concessional than what we observe in this portfolio. Um, and then uh, grace periods uh, that are longer for the bank. But in each case, I think one thing that it is important to observe, because this too often gets exaggerated, particularly in political discussions, is that by different measures of concessionality, China is lending on concessional terms. I mean, these are not market terms for the countries that we're talking about. Um, you know, there is a grace, there is an average grace period we can observe, uh, fairly long maturities, and the interest rate uh, is, um, well, higher than, than what we would think of as an average World Bank interest rate, um, still in the universe of, of some kind of concessionality. Um, nonetheless, um, in terms of what we're observing in debt risk today, uh, one of the key features, and, and certainly that what has been highlighted by the bank and the fund, is that it has been sort of the declining concessionality among external creditors to low-income countries that is driving a lot of the debt risks. Um, so not just overall volumes, but the fact that they are having uh, to pay harder terms. Um, so if, if we are taking the bank and the MDBs generally as sort of a gold standard for concessionality, um, then clearly China is a contributing factor to a hardening of terms overall. Uh, for these countries. Uh, to shift a little bit to the, the picture for the borrowing countries themselves, th these are two different um, presentations of, of how the bank and the fund uh, consider the capacity of, of the borrowing countries to manage th their debt risk and their overall public uh, debt management uh, capacity. And I, um, while they are particularly hard to read, I suppose, on the screen, I, I did put them up here because I think it is a reality check on, um, on the current picture and, and is yet another reason to have concerns about uh, the current outlook. That namely, um, if we're looking at on, on the left in terms of percentage of, overall percentage of, of these countries that meet some minimum, minimum score on these different metrics, um, even in the best of categories, we're only talking about half of low-income countries that are performing at a minimum of capacity. Um, and then on the right, uh, in part, I just note a neat trick of presentation among these official institutions when, <laughs> when you read the text of what they, you know, they, they always want to be careful and measured in their remarks. And, and what they've done with this particular chart is introduce negative values down to the center of the presentation. So you have to look at it very closely to, to observe that, in fact, in a, in a lot of these measures, we actually have seen 
uh, a decline in the number of countries meeting minimum standards. Now, um, I think you know one key question around around this picture is the degree to which there's real backsliding in countries, or that frankly they are uh, racing to catch up to a much more complex reality when it comes to uh, their own borrowing picture. That that namely. Uh, the, 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 the kind of lending they're doing, uh, the types of instruments uh, more, are more complex today than they, they were uh, in an earlier period. Obviously, the diversity of creditors themselves introduces greater complexity. But as I will note in, in um, later slides, things like um, you know, public-private partnerships, um, contingency arrangements, uh, the, you know, things that are not standard debt arrangements, um, are challenging the capacity of public financial management in these countries. And so by, uh, you know, by measures of, of assessing uh, performance, we, we are observing essentially a decline uh, for a significant number of countries. And that's, that is a concern uh, for uh, debt risk. So let me shift um, to thinking about the policy context then for, for this debt picture. Um, and I'll, I'll focus um, particularly on the role of sort of multilateral um, uh, fora and, and uh, coordination around particularly, you know, in the case of the Paris Club, when countries are in debt distress, uh, how in particular do their official creditors seek to coordinate and respond in a timely way. And what's striking, I put two different quotes up here. One is from the the recent bank and fund paper on low-income country debt outlook uh, in which they simply observe that since 2015, the Paris Club has not played a leading role in any of the low-income country debt restructurings. Um, and then more strikingly to me, frankly, is to hear the managing director of the IMF last week say essentially that the Paris Club doesn't matter anymore. Uh, I, I don't think I'm mischaracterizing the, the quote that I put on the screen. And that's, you know, I think a lot of us have been sort of questioning the fate of, of what has been a central coordinating body. Uh, it's striking to me how quickly in the official sector now seems to be saying it out loud. Um, and of course, um, the reason for all of this is the so-called non-Paris Club creditors, and chief among them China, uh, uh, has chosen not uh, to formally join a body that has sought to coordinate uh, all official creditors in cases where countries uh, need some kind of debt treatment uh, to, to, to manage um, uh, their debt distress. Um, and that, that is when you are at that point of uh, seeking some kind of relief or restructuring, um, the, uh, the question of what comes after the Paris Club really is, is a leading question. Um, and you know, I'm happy to talk about that later. I don't think there are obvious answers, except that we are clearly already in an ad hoc world when it comes to uh, how official uh, creditors are going to behave. It really is on a country by country basis. Um, and more and more, it is the case that, that China is, go is going to be the mo most important actor in the room in a lot of these cases. Um, so what we do observe from the Chinese is some effort at least, if nothing else, politically, to send a signal that they, are, they themselves are worried about uh, debt risk in, in the countries that borrow from them. Uh, so what we saw at the Belt and Road Forum last year was the introduction of, of a BRI debt sustainability framework. Um, in content, it is mostly borrowed from the existing framework uh, that is used by the World Bank and the IMF. Um, in the rhetoric around this, there, there is an emphasis that this is a voluntary framework available to uh, any Belt and Road country that wishes to use it. Uh, frankly, that's uh, at best a head scratcher of a, of a statement and, and is, is concerning when, when one thinks about uh, what, what uh, we should be looking for from a framework, that it, it ought to be binding in some way, frankly. Uh, on the countries that are that are uh, uh, part of the either playing the credit role of creditor or borrower, um, but then you know more importantly, even if we were to assume that somehow uh, China as a as the leading Belt and Road creditor and and leading official creditor in the world today among bilaterals, decided that it it was going to make binding on its own lenders this new debt sustainability framework, 
there are still really important questions and frankly troubling ones about the lack of coordination with um, the bank and the fund, uh, more multilateral approaches. Namely, that even with a nearly identical framework, um, outcomes look very different depending on the economic assumptions you make, assumptions about uh, growth, recovering the economy. Um, so once again, um, it is why we will be looking for coordination and all countries playing off of the same playbook when it comes to uh, what, what are the inputs going into the framework that deliver uh, the outcomes um, when it comes to guiding lending decisions. Um, and then, you know, again, more generally, the, the question of where creditor coordination does fit into this, if it essentially becomes a competing debt sustainability framework, um, I would argue that that's actually a step backward um, from, from no observable framework uh, uh, coming from the Chinese. Beyond um, you know, strictly debt sustainability questions, there's a broader set of questions around uh, how the international community is thinking about China's role uh, in financing infrastructure, uh, and the agenda is generally defined around questions of project quality and effectiveness, but it really touches on a wide range of uh, features of infrastructure finance, including how you do the procurement as, as sort of a leading issue, but certainly environmental and social uh, impact issues, safeguards in those areas. And what we are seeing, um, instead of, uh, I think, an agenda that was moving slowly, uh, painfully slowly with, with not a terrible amount of progress prior to 2016, but nonetheless did exist and was meaningful and, and had the participation of leading actors like the United States and China in coming, coming together on some sort of clearly articulated framework, again, that would in some way bind the lending activities of these leading countries. We are now in an era of you know, what, we, what these countries themselves are describing as development competition. I mean, it's not just a competition, and I'll come to this on financing, it seems to be a competition for uh, who's, who's saying the best things when it comes to these standards issues. So for the, for the US part, we have the announcement of a so-called Blue Dot Network um, with very, uh, as, as I hear reports, aggressive efforts uh, to encourage uh, key, essentially, G7 countries uh, to come along and join them. Um, around this network that somehow um, with maybe $2 million from the US government will uh, certify project infrastructure project quality around the world and will be a resource available to uh, borrowing countries to help them toward more quality infrastructure. Um, and that is effectively competing with uh, the effort of the Chinese government um, around something called the Multilateral Cooperation Center for Development Finance. Um, which in many ways is, is talking the same talk as the U.S. is on Blue Dot Network. Uh, this multilateral center um, was announced to be hosted now at the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And there again, as I've, uh, I've observed in some meetings, there have been aggressive efforts by the Chinese government to court these very same G7 countries along with other countries to join um, this cooperation center to pursue uh, higher standards and quality infrastructure in developing countries. As a matter of pure efficiency, this doesn't strike me as a helpful dynamic in the world. Um, I think there's sort of, if you step back and think about the obvious, if we could remove the politics around uh, the US-China conflict, Europe-China conflict, however you want to define it, uh, it's very clear that we, we have a longstanding set of multilateral fora for pursuing these issues. I think we, we need the leading countries to get back to thinking about cooperation in this area, that particularly if they are talking about the same kinds of principles, um, it isn't helpful to pair competition around this with outright competition for financing. So here I, I observe, uh, and we've heard already in this conference, uh, the announcement of a new US Development Finance Corporation, which uh, more or less is, is, is simply um, uh, a very significant expansion in the over ex overall exposure limit of, of the existing OPIC, uh, which is a longstanding U.S. agency that does overseas investment. Um, and it's essentially a doubling of their ability 
of their outstanding exposures to $60 billion. Um, and, you know, strikingly, and it's hard, hard to miss the fact that uh, the White House in rolling this out um, uh, did so directly as a, as a counter to China and Belt and Road and a source of competition. I think it's been overhyped. So let's look at um, annual OPIC commitments uh, uh, as we, we see them through 2018, uh, and particularly of which for Africa in 2018 was 825 million. Um, if we simply assume a doubling of exposure limits could allow for a doubling to Africa, so we're at about one and a half billion a year, um, that's not nothing. And, and I, you know, I'm certainly not dismissive of this. I should, should have uh, prefaced this by saying I support uh, the creation of the DFC. I think it is a positive step in general. Um, but again, I think it's, it's been greatly exaggerated and unfortunately positioned, again, to be a so-called so counter or competitor uh, to China when, in fact, the reality of its scale of financing is that it, it will remain modest in the world of development finance. But not only that, and, and you know, this points to a concern about this, is that if the dynamic really is competition, we are going to see, um, most likely we will not see a doubling of that 825 million for Africa. That in fact, the real action for the new DFC will be in countries like Argentina, where last fall, uh, with the visit of the president's daughter to Argentina, we saw the announcement of an OPIC investment in a in a road project, a toll road project in that country. Um, it is fair to say that it, you know in OPIC's longer history, they've certainly invested in some upper middle income countries, but even uh, during the OPIC era, that was always viewed with a bit of a raised eyebrow. And in fact, in the legislation that created the new corporation this past year. Uh, one of the reasons places like our center were so happy with it is the, the strong emphasis that it put on development effectiveness, number one, and also a focus on low-income countries. In fact, it set key barriers um, to how much could be going at all to middle-income countries, let alone upper-middle income, and now increasingly what we expect could be even some high-income country investments. I think that is all driven by this China dynamic and it really has very little to do with promoting development effectiveness in these countries. So finally, um, just to shift course uh, abruptly again and just leave you with what I see as more generally th the questions I would like better answers to when it comes to thinking about uh, BRI and then more generally infrastructure investment in these countries. Um, I think we are, and, and the signals we get from the bank and the fund is that there's this growing concern about um, uh, uses of, of particular arrangements that, on the one hand, do facilitate investment in low-income countries, things like collateral, but on the other hand, carry their own risk and complexity uh, in ways that we're not used to dealing with. And I think there, there's clearly a sense, and I think we need to have a better understanding of the frequency of these activities, the use of collateral, and then the effect of that, um, whether it's when it comes to actual debt workouts, but more generally just in terms of performance of these low-income countries. Um, the overall question of cross-border infrastructure investment generally, its performance. Um, my impression as a policymaker working with the multilaterals for a number of years is that these are exceedingly difficult projects to pursue. Um, have the Chinese figured it out, um, whether it's in Belt and Road or just uh, through earlier history? Um, I'm not convinced of that. I think we need to understand it better. Um, performance of the ones that have existed and the barriers to moving forward with this. Um, when it comes to the Chinese, is tied financing worse than no financing? Um, I, be I believe very strongly in competitive procurement, but um, in the absence of it, are we satisfied uh, that, that these projects should not exist? Um, and you know, what, what really are the distortions that are introduced by um, non-competitive arrangements as, as we see that dominates Chinese financing. Um, and then just very quickly, um, the degree to which there are these trade-offs between, you know, what we know to be growth effects from infrastructure, but then all of the other stuff that we worry about when it comes to infrastructure projects that I would define around equity and accountability. What does that trade-off really look like? Um, to some degree, I think the Chinese represent 
uh, one, one extreme of the spectrum and perhaps the World Bank is at another and is there somewhere in between that we need to be and we are not. And then finally, um, I still don't understand exactly how China's macro picture affects BRI. And, and, you know, I haven't heard enough about it uh, in terms of the dynamics and the interplays, the risks that uh, the lend this lending project poses to China on a macro basis. So um, I will stop there. Thanks.